Michael Jordan is widely considered to be the greatest basketball player of all time. Throughout his career, he was known for his extraordinary work ethic, intense training regimen, and relentless drive to win. Jordan's motivation to improve and excel in his sport allowed him to achieve unparalleled success, including six NBA championships and numerous individual awards. On the other hand, Allen Iverson, another incredibly talented basketball player, had a different approach to the game. While he was undoubtedly skilled and achieved significant success in his career, he was famously quoted as saying, Listen, we're talking about practice. Downplaying the importance of practice and training. Despite his talent, Iverson's career did not reach the same heights as Jordan's, with no NBA championships and a somewhat shorter career. What sets these two gifted athletes apart? The answer lies in motivation. Let me ask you a question. How would you explain motivation to a 12-year-old? We all have a general idea of what it means, but pinning down a precise definition can be tricky. In this lecture, we'll explain various theories that tackle this question and discuss practical ways to enhance motivation in the workplace. Think of motivation as a driving force that influences what we do, how hard we try, and how long we keep at it. Most definitions of motivation touch on these three key components, direction, intensity, and persistence. So direction refers to where we focus our attention. Intensity is all about how hard we work, and persistence is the duration of time we spend on a task. Donovan writes that motivation is a set of energetic forces that originate both within and beyond an individual to initiate work-related behavior and determine its form, direction, intensity, and duration. Another definition states that motivation energizes and directs behavior towards specific goals and sustains the effort required to reach these goals. So these definitions highlight these essential components of motivation, its direction, its intensity, and its duration. Now you might be wondering, why is motivation important? People perform at different levels in any given job for various reasons. Differences in performance may be due to factors such as skill and ability levels, personality traits like conscientiousness, which we'll cover later, physical conditions like outdated equipment, and psychological factors like career orientation or career aspiration. We'll discuss in the lecture on selection how we can use psychological assessment to help us identify the best job candidates. However, individual characteristics only explain about 25% of the variance in job performance. So once you've selected the right people, a really important question is how do you keep them interested and motivated? That's what we'll explore in this journey through the realm of motivation. Here's a roadmap of what we'll cover in today's video. We'll start by discussing some influential theories of motivation, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, motivation hygiene theory, and expectancy theory. And then I'll introduce you to some more recent theories that are still influential today. Theories like reinforcement theory, cognitive evaluation theory, self-determination theory, and goal setting theory. And finally, we'll discuss how these theoretical principles can be used in practice to enhance motivation in the workplace. We'll start with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You've probably seen this iconic pyramid with each level representing a different human need. At the base, we've got physiological needs like food and sleep. Once those are sorted, it's time to focus on security, like having a safe place to call home. Next up is belongingness, where we seek connections and relationships with others. And then we look for esteem, which involves status and recognition. Finally, we reach the peak of the pyramid, which is self-actualization, where we strive for personal growth and achievement. Now let's put a workplace spin on Maslow's hierarchy. Imagine physiological needs as income and suitable work hours. Safety needs come into play with secure procedures and equipment, while belongingness involves building bonds with coworkers. Esteem is all about being recognized and valued for your contributions, and self-actualization means seizing opportunities to develop your skills and knowledge. But here's the twist. While Maslow's hierarchy is a compelling framework, it's not quite as straightforward as it seems. The theory is broad and somewhat vague, making it tricky to test. Sure, we need to satisfy our basic needs, but our journey towards self-actualization isn't always a neat and tidy climb. We often juggle multiple needs at once, and they don't always follow the hierarchy's order. Interestingly, the pyramid concept wasn't even Maslow's original idea. 
It was misattributed to him later on. Maslow's main focus was on the importance of psychological needs beyond basic necessities. This groundbreaking idea laid the groundwork for positive psychology. And guess what? People's needs also differ depending on factors like age and personal circumstances. Recent university graduates might be all about the paycheck, while older individuals could be after more intrinsically motivating jobs. Parents might prioritize job security. So our needs can vary wildly, and they don't always align with Maslow's proposed order. Now we'll take a look at Friedrich Hertzberg's motivation hygiene theory. So picture this. You're working at your dream job, but something's missing and you're not quite sure what it is. How do we figure out what we need to thrive in a particular workplace? Hertzberg was curious about what made people feel good or bad about their jobs. So he asked workers to describe situations that made them happy or unhappy at work. From these stories, he developed a two-factor model with hygiene factors and motivating factors. Imagine you're a software engineer. Hygiene factors might include your salary, your office chair, or even the office coffee. These factors prevent dissatisfaction, but won't necessarily make you love your job. In contrast, motivating factors like challenging projects, recognition for your work, and opportunities for growth are what makes people truly satisfied. Hertzberg's theory was groundbreaking because it started to distinguish between intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. His ideas have influenced how we design jobs to be more engaging and enjoyable. Research supports the idea that satisfaction and dissatisfaction come from different factors. For example, a promotion or praise from your boss might boost your satisfaction, while a frustrating company policy could leave you dissatisfied. To help managers understand this concept, Hertzberg used a cool rocket metaphor. Picture hygiene factors as the launching pad and motivators as the rocket fuel. The stronger the motivators, the higher your job satisfaction soars. This concept reshaped our approach to motivation, steering away from coercive tactics and instead focusing on nurturing genuine enthusiasm and interest in work. Back in the 60s when this research was taking place, this transformative idea was far from obvious. Today, it seems like common sense, but at the time, it served as a significant turning point that has guided a wealth of future research and theorizing in the field of motivation. Hertzberg's theory was definitely influential, but like any theory, it's not without its critics. One issue they point out is that the conclusions might be too tied up with the method he used to gather his data. Just imagine people sitting around sharing stories about their best and worst days at work, and Hertzberg then sorts these tales into categories of satisfying or dissatisfying experiences, which led to the distinction between motivation and hygiene factors. Maybe not the most reliable or rigorous method. Some skeptics argue that this method might have introduced a bias in the factors, and this has led to some to question the validity of the theory. Another point critics raise is that Hertzberg's theory doesn't quite cover all the bases. It overlooks individual differences and situational factors, like how some industries might value pay more as a motivating factor. And let's not forget, the theory doesn't factor in performance or account for the diverse cultural and professional backgrounds that could impact motivation. Despite these shortcomings, Hertzberg's theory was a game changer in its time that has significantly influenced our understanding of motivation and job satisfaction by prompting us to consider how intrinsic and extrinsic factors play a role in our work experiences. Next up, Vroom's expectancy theory. Now, what if I told you that motivation is like a puzzle made up of three pieces, and those pieces are expectancy, instrumentality, and valence. This is the fundamental assumption of expectancy theory. Expectancy theory is all about how likely you think it is that you can achieve a specific outcome. Let's say you're a salesperson with a target of 10 sales by month end. You'll be more motivated to work hard if you believe you can actually reach that goal. And then we have instrumentality, which is the likelihood that your stellar performance will lead to something awesome. So our salesperson might be thinking, Okay, I can hit that sales target, but what's in it for me? A bonus? A pat on the back? Lastly, we have valence, the value of the outcome. If our salesperson is going to get a bonus, how much will it be? Is it worth it, or would they rather have something else, like recognition or time off? According to expectancy theory, these three factors blend together to influence how motivating a particular task or behavior is. If all three are high, you've got yourself a motivated individual. 
but if one or more are lower, then motivation can be compromised. Imagine that your favorite music artist announces a once in a lifetime opportunity. They will personally perform a private concert for anyone who can run a marathon in under three hours within the next month. Let's break down our motivation according to Vroom's expectancy theory here. For expectancy, for most people, running a marathon in under three hours is quite a challenge, especially if you're not already an experienced runner. So your expectancy of achieving this feat might be quite low. Instrumentality, assuming the music artist is known for keeping their promises, you would likely believe that if you were able to complete the marathon within the required time, you'd get to enjoy that exclusive concert. So instrumentality in this case could be quite high. How about valence? If you're a big fan of the artist, the valence would be very high as a private concert is a rare and highly desirable reward. However, despite the high valence and in instrumentality, the overall motivation to attempt this task might still be low because of the low expectancy. The challenge seems too difficult to achieve, making it less likely for you to put in effort and try. The concepts of expectancy, instrumentality, and valence can also be broken down into three relationships. So first, the relationship between effort and performance. How likely is it that your effort will lead to success, which maps onto expectancy? Second, the relationship between performance and reward. How likely is, that, is it that your success will bring about something desirable, which is instrumentality? And finally, the relationship between rewards and personal goals. So how much do you value the potential outcome or reward? And that's valence. These relationships help us understand how we can intervene in different situations to boost motivation. So to strengthen the effort performance relationship or expectancy, training and development are vital. They provide employees with the necessary skills and knowledge to excel in their tasks, increasing their confidence and belief that they can succeed. For the performance rewards relationship or instrumentality, implementing a performance appraisal system is key. This system measures changes in people's performance and ensures that good performance is recognized and rewarded, encouraging employees to continue striving for success. Lastly, to enhance the rewards personal goals relationship or valence, effective human resource management strategies are essential. These strategies involve understanding the unique needs and values of employees and tailoring rewards accordingly, making the outcomes more appealing and motivating for each individual. Expectancy theory is a widely supported motivational concept, but it does have some areas that are up for debate. One challenge in refining or showing evidence for the theory comes from how it has been tested in the past. You see, the surveys back then were all about forced choice questions that required a straightforward yes or no response. So in the example before, you'd have to decide between saying, yes, I'm definitely going to run this marathon or no, I'm out. There's no room to express more moderate levels of motivation. Nowadays, we know it's better to measure motivation on a continuous scale, say from one to seven, where seven is hell yes, and one is never gonna happen. And the midpoint of the scale is maybe. When we measure effort and motivation using a more fine grain scale, like a Likert scale, the theory is better supported. Expectancy theory also assumes that expectancy, instrumentality, and valence work together like a magical mathematical equation to determine motivation. But people question whether these components truly work together in that particular way. While each aspect seems to influence motivation independently, their specific interaction isn't set in stone. Another aspect of expectancy theory that raises eyebrows is its indifference towards the types of rewards, whether they're extrinsic like money or bonuses or intrinsic, such as a sense of accomplishment. This leaves room for debate in the theory. Some critics also argue about the theory's practicality. So research suggests that only about 11% of employees have a say in how they or their subordinates are rewarded at work. If the key assumption is that employees are motivated when valence is high, but employees have no control over how they're rewarded, then implementing the theory as an intervention becomes challenging. But the most common criticism of expectancy theory is that it assumes humans are fully aware of all their potential actions and can calculate the motivational potential of each one based on expectancy, instrumentality, and valence. But let's be real, people don't always work like that. Sometimes we just choose a course of action that's good enough to meet a goal rather than finding the absolute best option. 
Despite these concerns, expectancy theory can still be useful in practice. Managers and consultants can use it to diagnose performance issues, particularly by examining the expectancy and instrumentality aspects of the model. For instance, is it that an employee's expectancy is low, believing their efforts won't lead to success? Or is it that their instrumentality is low, thinking that even if they succeed, there won't be any rewards? Answering these questions will help determine the right intervention to boost motivation.